Well, it's 7 o'clock. Welcome you all to the Milton City Hall. I'm going to call the meeting of the Milton Plan Commission for Tuesday, August 13, 2019, to order. And the first item is the roll call. Farrar? Here. Hubbard? Present. Murray? Here. Slavish? Here. And Paulson, Bertahert, and Ramsey are absent. Boy, they're going to miss all the excitement, <laughs> wherever they may be. So. So can I introduce Stephanie quickly? Yes, okay. yes. Um, so before the meeting gets started, I just wanted to introduce our new associate planner, Daphne Shu. Um, Daphne recently moved here from L.A., but she has been through a Midwest winter, so don't, don't be too concerned. She grew up in Illinois, she just recently got her bachelor's degree in urban planning, and um, thanks to Jen Murray, who helped on the hiring panel, and we were able to Skype with Daphne a couple of times, and she started uh, two weeks ago now, I believe, just, just under two weeks ago, and is hitting the ground running. So, so you actually went to Urbana, right? Urbana Champaign? Or? Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I did undergrad at University of Illinois, and then my master's at University of Southern California. Oh, wow. Two great schools, huh? <laughs> And then, of course, we got great schools right here, too, so <laughs> for you to learn more things. <laughs> All right, so the first item on the, it's not 705, the first item on the agenda is the minutes, so. Move approval. Second. All right, the motion is to approve the minutes. Everybody's happy with that. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously, how about that? So we are on to item number two. Definitely you're going to show us item number two here now. This is the sign design review by Kelly's Market 8613 University Avenue. Yeah, so this, this um, is pretty straightforward. The signs <coughs> are very similar in size to what was there previously, and this is basically a request due to rebranding of Kelly's Market um, just to kind of create a different look for their sign package. So do we have somebody from Kelly's Market here? So why, what is the purpose of rebranding? You, you can come to the microphone here, sir, and make it look better, fresher, more attractive. Yeah, the desire was to streamline the look and get rid of the old logo. Okay. Any questions? Could you... Specify your name and uh, my name is John Harder. I'm actually with Harder Sign Company. I'm representing Kelly Williamson. Okay, any questions for John Harder? We want to verify that the proposed sign dimension is, is yeah. 42 inches, inches tall yes. by yes. 22. That was a typo, yes. So it is not 42. <laughs> no, <laughs> so it, it meets all of the requirements. Uh, Size-wise, blah, 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 blah. I'd move approval. I'll second that. Yeah, I like the color, actually. It looks pretty nice. So so you're going to be, it's going to be lighted like the other one? or Interior lighted. Interior lighted? Yes. Okay. So otherwise, it essentially stays the same as there, so. Correct. Any other questions for John Harder? Well, do you want to add anything, John? Nothing. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, so if there are no more questions, all those in favor of the motion to approve the sign design review for Kelly's Market and nice blue color, say aye. 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 Anyone oppose? John, go and celebrate. Thank you. All right. So the next one is the Item number three, specific implementation plan modification for signage for Incredible Bank at 8329 Murphy Drive. Folks, this is incredible. All right. Yeah, so this is pretty similar to the last request. Actually, it's a replacement of existing signage. Um, this is a rebranding and actually a new name for what is currently River Valley Bank. And it, oh, this is for the River Valley Bank. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. On wow. Highway 14. Yes, yes. And this again meets our signage um, requirements and. 
you want to say anything, sir? I know you are. There is a gentleman from specify your name and. Uh... Matt Waller with Graphic House Sign Company in Wausau. Um, yeah, mainly it's just a rebranding. Um, River Valley is changing to Incredible Bank. Um, Graphic House did a majority of these signs uh, a few years back. Um, so mainly it's on this freestanding sign, it's a quick face replacement, color change. The building sign, actually we're going from three building signs down to two. Uh, the one on the east elevation above the main entrance will still be illuminated. Uh, the one on the north elevation would be non-lit. How, how did you pick this uh, beautiful orange color, orange and black? It really does look very I, nice. I honestly cannot take credit for that. That came from the bank itself, so we're just trying to make it look good on the signage. Okay, so there's a motion to approve. Need a second. Second. All right. Any questions for the sign or anything while he's there? So go ahead, Jennifer. Um, it says that the sign is lit with white LED. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, and does that, and the if, um, one above that <clears throat> sort of is pointing to an area at the very top of the graphic. Um, is that a specific area that will be lit with another light, or is that white part the only part that's lit up? The, on the freestanding sign, the white area is going to be illuminated. Same thing with, with the sign above the main entrance on the east elevation. That entire white area is going to be illuminated. Okay. And then on the north side, that is a non-lit non sign. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any more questions? Leaf. I'm good. you like, well, you got the orange on your T-shirt there. It matches it, right? So, Mike, any more questions? Nope. Okay, if there are more questions, the motion is approved. The Passive implementation plan modification for signage for the Incredible Bank, which is changing from the River Valley Bank to Incredible. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. All right. So All right. celebrate. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Okay. We are on to item number four. Boy, it's moving quite. Uh, Did you quite want to do the public hearing? Uh, it is seven. Oh, it is seven oh five. So let's go to the public hearing. That uh, conditional use permit for three zero five five Deming Way Town Place Suites by Marriott. Anybody? I can see a lot of people who want to speak here, both in favor and against. Right? Do I have any takers? Anybody who wants to speak? Wow. Okay. So then I'm going to close that part of the public hearing and. Uh, then we go to item number four, conditional use permit and specific implementation plan for 3055 of Deming Bay, Town Place Suites by Marriott. So, Abby, you want to take it? Sure. Um, Marco Fitz prepared the staff report for this. Uh, we've been working with the applicant. One of the major issues that we had flagged at the plan commission meeting and council meeting previously was the secondary point of access and I remember there being a lot of discussion from the plan commission about the need for the secondary access. The applicant has now secured a cross access easement um, across the property to the west. Okay. It will actually straddle the lot line which is nice because then it could serve um, all three properties potentially. That issue has been resolved. There is another issue that has come up um, and that is that there are some wetlands on the property. Um, at least that's what our wetland maps are showing there. I believe that they're in the process of doing a wetland um, delineation and maybe they could actually provide an update on that at this meeting tonight. Um, based on a, a lack of full understanding about the wetlands that exist on the property, um, Mark had recommended um, deferring, however, if the wetland um, consideration could be satisfactory, addressed satisfactorily at this meeting, then he had five recommendations for contingencies um, that could be placed on any approval for this. Do we have for somebody from, uh, okay, come here please and, <clears throat> and let us know where you are with uh, that wetland delineation and. Uh, yeah, 
Um, so my name is Bruce Holler with D'Onofrio Katkin Associates, the engineer. Um, the wetland issue, so we had a delineation completed. Uh, the report was just finished up today. Um, it's likely from the assured delineator that did the report. Is that what we see on the map here, that's it? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, the assured delineator has uh, kind of given his opinion that it's in like all likelihood an artificial wetland. And because of that, we're submitting an application to the DNR for them to give their sort of um, confirmation that it is. And if it is, a, if it is an art, deemed an artificial wetland, then um, by the DNR, then, we, then uh, there aren't any further permits needed to fill it. Um, so that's what we're pursuing at this point. Okay, so when would oh. you know it? Well, once the application goes in, which should be within a week, they mm. have uh, a matter of 15 working days, I believe, to okay. uh, give us a, an answer on that. Okay. Any other questions, Abby, other than wetland? Um, <clears throat> well, there were some uh, recommendations for contingencies. So one is the shared access easement that we already talked about. Um, another one is to address any issues identified in the traffic impact analysis. And I don't think we've seen the TIA for this project yet. I could be wrong. Maybe it was recently completed, but we haven't reviewed it. Um, and typically Public Works Committee would also accept the traffic impact analysis report. Um, and then resolve any conflicts between trees, hydrants, and light pole that Mark noted in his staff report. And then, um, of course, any additional approvals for signage will need to come forward at a later date. So yeah. where are you with TIA? Is that done or not yet? With the TIA? The TIA, yeah. Traffic information. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's done yet or not. I, I haven't talked to Steve, our client, um, regarding that. But all of those conditions are acceptable to us. Okay, okay. So Joe, just a question on that. So the, the easement on the north side of the property, that's, that's just an easement at this point. That Will that road actually be constructed as part of the development of this site? Or will that be done when the parcel of the west is, is developed? The access out to Nursery Drive? Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's our understanding that that will be built. Will be built. That that would be a condition of, of the approval. So that's what we were anticipating. Just clarifying. Yep. Okay, Jennifer, any questions? Um, nope, I'd like to make a motion to accept the contingencies that were mentioned and grant a conditional use permit recommendation to the Common Council approval. Are we ready for that part? Are we ready for the? Um, as long as the wetland Subject to. Yeah, the, the condition other. of the DNA. Sub yeah, yeah, subject yep. to. All of that is within the. That included the DNR yep. report. Yep. Okay. I'll, I'll so second you, that. So you feel okay with that? Yes. Okay. How about you leave? Yep, I'm good. As long as those five conditions are met. Yep. 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 Just as just as proposed and seconded. Okay. You guys want to add anything? No. So we are still waiting for the TIA, right? Yes. So and the Indeed. TIA would, the, the contingency regarding the TIA would be not only that the city would accept the report, but if there were any recommendations for improvements at any intersections um, that would be required as part of this project, then um, those would have to be satisfied as well. And so typically the TIA report goes to Public Works Committee. Public Works Committee makes a recommendation <coughs> on any <coughs> items that need to be satisfied and that would carry forward under your contingency of approval. All right. So it doesn't come back here then, does it? Not unless there's an unresolved issue. Um, there wouldn't really be a need for it to come back. We would, we would not issue a permit to start work on the property until all of the conditions are satisfied. Okay. So everybody's happy with this? Okay, then the, uh, the motion is the conditional use permit for the specific impl implementation plan for 3005 Deming Way Town Place Suites by Marriott. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. So Great. Thank you.
work with the DNR and DIA and uh, move forward. So That's thank good. you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, item number five, certified survey map, CSM lot line adjustment, Thomas Gaff, 2105 North Gateway. Tom, you want to come and say why are you doing it? And uh, I, I know you, we, we have gotten to know you pretty well now, so you like making changes to that. <laughs> to that, part, that parcel is creating you some issues, isn't it? Um, <laughs> mm. We're getting there, so. <laughs> Tom Goff, Middleton. Uh, I've got a, a buyer for the home on the existing lot six, and they're requesting a little bit bigger backyard. They have children and a dog, and uh, logistically, it kind of makes sense to, to give them that area since it's behind their home, and it, uh, they'll be maintaining it versus the person on Charing Cross. So um, we will still meet all the SIP uh, requirements of the 20-foot front yard setback, 30-foot rear yard, inside lots, and we'll meet the uh, impervious surface air area too. So um, for the, the new home that would be built on the, the new lot too, basically, so. Well, that's good. You have somebody who wants to buy it. So Abby, what do you mm -hmm. have? Hmm? What do you recommend have approval of this again? I mean, it really won't change <clears throat> what can be developed overall on the properties. It's just, a matter of shifting a lot line to give more yard to one lot and take away part of the yard from another lot. Right. I'd move approval. Okay, now the questions. What do you think, Michael? I think it's fine. I don't see where there's any issue here. Jennifer. Looks good. And, okay, all right. The motion is to approve the certified survey map with the line adjustment for 2105 North Gateway. So all those in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? So the motion passes. Wow, this was quick. Thank you. Down, so. Probably seen it two weeks again. <laughs> okay. We are on to item number six. And uh, Newcom Group is all here. So it is a concept review for Newcom Mixed use development at 1312 John Q. Hemming Drive. So right now we got a big parking lot there and there's gonna be a beautiful building. So maybe you want to start or? I think we can turn it over to the applicant. All right, let the, the Brett and team begin. So well, identify yourself and then. What yes. a breath of fresh air to be back, back in Middleton. Um, so I'm Brett Newcomb. And uh, we have a family construction company, Newcomb Construction. I'm second generation. I live in Middleton. We've built a lot of buildings in Middleton. My kids have gone to school here. So, you know, we're honored to have the opportunity to do a development uh, in Middleton. And I think make a really nice improvement to a fantastic location. Um, this site is located right across from the Marriott Hotel uh, within eyeshot of Starbucks and the Greenway Station amenities. Um, my office is not far from there, but it's in Madison in the Old Stock Trails Business Park. Which you will move to Middleton, right? I'm I, just kidding. I think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's vote on that. Uh, so our vision for this particular site is to um, hot thing one, one second, we lost the mic. He's going to come and get it because we need it for the video. Mm -hmm. I can move around. Okay, um, so the hot thing now with development is East Washington Avenue, and the, the, the East Wash vibe has a lot of great things about it, but it also has some things that are challenging um, for businesses, including traffic, uh, parking, and then rental rates on East Wash are very expensive. So we said to ourselves, can you take all the great things of an East Wash development and move it to the suburbs? So that's our vision for this particular site. Um, I'm going to allow our architect, Plunkett Racish, to speak on the three concepts. But we have the first concept is the standard three-story building with all surface parking, which is kind of what you see all over the place. But that's not in our vision. But it's the cheapest way to develop a piece of property. The other two options include a parking structure. And that parking structure allows us to do more of a high-density development, which then would allow for a four-story office building and then also for an, an apartment building to be on the same site. So that 
really starts to play into our thoughts about how to best develop this particular site. And the third option would be instead of a three-story apartment to go to a four-story apartment. Um, I'm going to briefly allow uh, Jason to, to introduce himself, but he would be the tenant and a potential investor in this development and take the entire top floor of the office building. Uh, and he has a business in Madison, so if you don't mind, yeah. briefly. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank well, you. Welcome to Middleton. So. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Jason Moss, and uh, I'm a, uh, we have a, a significant business uh, called the Burrish Group, which you may have heard of uh, as part of UBS, and um, currently reside in an office building also in the office park, Old Sock Trails Park, really not very far from this location. And through our interaction with Brett and uh, kind of the concept of this project, we're very interested in this project and excited about uh, what it has to offer. So um, just couldn't be happier to be a part of this meeting and, and to observe the process here, but very attractive opportunity for us. So. Good, good. Uh, if, if you don't have any more questions uh, for me as the owner and developer, I'll let Kirk kind of walk through a couple of the design options that we're looking at. Well, you have done a great job with the Municipal Operations Center, with Spectrum Building, with Meat and Hunt, and with Fisk Cars. So, so I think you have pretty good examples already. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Kirk Keller, Plunkett Racich Architects. Uh, I'm going to take you through a little bit more in depth of the three options. Try not to be labored, but Ms. Atun, if you could please, if any point you wish to speak to anything that staff has a comment on or anything, don't, don't hesitate. To, not necessarily a formal presentation, but if we could just, we'll go through the slides here and a quick comment on each. This is the three story building with parking lot, a real challenge to park. You can see we're not even showing tree islands in there. We'd be asking for to fit 75,000 square foot building on here. We'd want to uh, keep the idea of a major public space at the corner of Holiday and John Q. Hammonds and to then you really have to create a dense parking lot behind, which is not a bad thing because you're tucking into a hill of what used to be the old Globe University to the west. The parking lot still somewhat steps away it's not a main attraction as you're as you're traveling up holiday next slide please we could so this is the three-story building this is approximately 75,000 gross square feet uh, built by brett and it really plays to what we see as a long-term vision for john q hammond since some of the original buildings for the development and a number that i've done on on greenway um, are ripe for some redevelopment and greater density even across the street on the Marriott side, uh, I think we're going to see some ripple effect, and this is a statement to, to hopefully start some of that along uh, John Q. Hammond's. Next, please. So just some quick elevations, 14-foot um, floor-to-floor, Class A office space. You're seeing the, uh, the three-story here. Next, please. And we can keep going, please. So the same site again, but now we are at the uh, four-story building and there's a two-level parking deck and decks an important word here because it's not a ramp we're coming in at two elevations from the John Q Hammond side you are low from the holiday side you are high so there's not an interconnecting ramp it's two flat plates and it basically from the former globe property or from the cowboy jacks it looks like a parking lot because it's just up at the level of their property but it allows us the opportunity to create a lot of density here uh, that we still keep the great design that we're looking at at the corner, but it introduces the two options for the uh, apartment building. The three-story would be approximately 36 units. All the patient, all the tenant, patient, the tenant parking <laughs> would be underneath a one-to-one -one ratio underneath the, the the building. Too much medical work in my past. <laughs> the uh, uh, if we go to the four-story, if you're at 48 units we would be looking at the potential of some shared parking arrangement on the site. Hot seating, you're using a business space, you're using a, a space for, for living conditions in, in the evening. So it'd be coordination that the landlord, condition of the landlord there. But you're getting a good view here from John Q and, uh, and Holiday 
of, of how that starts to really activate that corner with, with a building next to it, uh, with the apartment building. And the four story really starts to make a statement on the corner. Uh, nice decks, we're looking at uh, a product that opens up the, uh, the window walls. You can see it right behind the 1312 address. The idea is that the building can open the street. So it's not just a public private building, but how do you go semi-public by creating little courtyards outside or feeling that the public could walk through this property to be semi-private. So it's a mix of, of, of uh, trying to get a little bit more of a, of a walkable environment here in an area that a lot of people do use for walking, running, biking. That's how I use it. Next, please. So you're seeing the same elevations, but obviously a little stronger when you hit four stories in height and uh, quite a bit of glass and, uh, and uh, materials that I think are, are, will look pretty elegant here. Obviously, we're not showing plantings or anything yet that will bring it to life. Next, please. Again, the other view, this happens to be from the, uh, the top elevation is looking uh, from uh, John Q. Hammond's Inn at the center of the elevation. You get the feeling of where the little umbrellas are that, you know, it's, it's a walkable level there. And very important to us, as, as it is as we've been working with uh, uh, the possible lead tenant for the building. Next, please. And thank you. This is a, uh, we, we put the concrete mix trucks on there just for Brett. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, the one view that you would not see on the three story because this is, this is what the parking deck would actually look like if, if, you, if the apartment building was, was whisked away and you were looking into. Uh, a, a cutaway of, of the property that it's just a naturally ventilated two-story deck, not unlike you see at the Fiskars, but tucked into the hillside. Please. And I think that ends the presentation. Glad to take any questions and otherwise. Yes, let's going. start with Michael. This is your, this is your field, right? <laughs> It is. Uh, I think, Kirk, I, I think it's a great looking building. Um, I like the four story option. Um, did you say there were three concepts? There are three. So and uh, what did we're we see three or did we see we're, two? We're, we're asking. In the write up, yes, because the, the apartment building will either be 36 units okay. or 48. So what we're looking for is to move forward as we market and develop for the GDP approval for each of those concepts. And obviously, we have to come back for the you know, specific or the precise implementation components of that when we do the full package. So there, so there is parking underneath the apartment building? Correct. But not under the office? Is that not correct? Not under the office. It is slab on grade for the office building. Any, any consideration, Brett, for putting parking under, under the office building, maybe you know, making the, the footprint of the parking structure a little smaller? Uh, the, the to give you uh, the economics of it, the parking structure costs about 10,000 per car. Underground parking is about 24,000 per car. It's stratospherically more expensive to do underground parking because you have to heat, sprinkle, cool, ventilate, all the stuff. Elevators have to go downstairs. So the economics alone um, kind of prevent us from doing that. But UBS has expressed interest in having it. Well, so what certain, certain tenants are willing to pay for that if they actually have parking within their building. And I think they might. So um, it has become a discussion since we've kind of done the plans. So I guess what I'm saying is that um, we're not definitely ruling it out. We're ruling it as a conversation with UBS at this point. So it may end up happening. I don't know if it'll sh make the parking structure smaller. It may just add to parking to have some stalls under the building. You know, my general reaction, I, I think it's a great looking design. I like the four story concept. Um, I think it'd be a great project for, for the city. I think four stories does make sense. I mean, you know, that will be much, much better use of that space. And I'm sure Jason would like a view from the fourth floor rather than third floor, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it linked to that thread would be um, the value of the signage. Uh, fourth floor or four story building signage is better visibility uh, from the Beltline. Mm -hmm. And we're currently on the Beltline right now. Mm -hmm. This would be obviously across the street, but I, I feel kind of as we've estimated it, it, it still seems uh, adequate, so. Jennifer. I also think the design looks really nice. I like the four-story option in both buildings. Um, I think it's an interesting mixed-use concept with the apartments and um, 
I think the potential is there for um, reinvigorating sort of that neighborhood with some permanence, with some people around more often and things like that, that are regulars kind of, so that's a good thing. Um, I'm interested how the parking will pan out. Um, that's an interesting uh, concept there. Have you talked with any of the neighbors about sharing parking at all? We have not. Um, you know, it's the Mad the Madison Middleton line is between this lot and uh, Cowboy Jacks. Okay. I know the owners of Cowboy Jacks. They asked me to buy their building from them. So, but the challenge is that Madison line. So it's like that easement to cross over. You de you're dealing with two different communities to try to make that happen. So, I I don't know. I mean, I, I would not be. Uh, aesthetically afraid of the parking structure because if you look at Fiskers which we built it's a beautiful uh, structure and that's right on the street yeah. and this one is gonna be tucked behind two buildings so and then into a hill so I don't know if you're really even gonna recognize that it's kind of a parking structure it's gonna just look like parking mm -hmm. so this will be actually pretty good fit with all what's happening with the South Hill Park that's almost getting filled up I think this would be pretty good Yes, Abby. A couple of things. Um, one prompted by Jen's comment about the shared parking or talking to the surrounding businesses. Um, one of the things when the plan commission released the requirement from the Marriott Hotel for having the surplus parking, the Marriott manager came and sp spoke in support of that. And um, but he said that there were like two events per year on the weekend that they they really could use the additional parking and so I think that the plan commission said in their recommendation that they would love it if the new development would work with the Marriott maybe just for those couple of events per year and allow some spillover especially if it works for your your land uses that you're proposing so it might work with the office if they're not if your office uh, employees aren't there on the weekends maybe you could work out some arrangement with the Marriott um, I just wanted to flag this for the plan commission that there will be a TIF request associated with this project. And usually for concept review, we bring the conceptual TIF request forward at the same time. Um, Bill and I have a staff recommendation that we're still working on with the applicant um, and we just weren't able to get it all put together in time. Um, but I think we're headed in the right direction there and um, the TIF request would likely be for the structured parking. Um, because we've typically looked at office um, structured parking for an office development as being a TIF eligible cost. Um, we also favor the options two or three, which is the structured parking with the office as well as residential. Um, and that's sh that opinion is shared by several of our staff members. We, there, was, there were a lot of compliments on the conceptual designs that have been presented. Um, we didn't hear any concerns from anybody on our staff. Everybody really liked the way that the buildings look here. And they, everybody really liked the, the parking being tucked into the hillside and also the shared parking possibility between the apartments and the office. So all around it was very favorable. Wow, you made Abby pretty happy, Brad. So, <laughs> yes, leave. I also uh, think that the uh, four-story uh, office and uh, resident um, multifamily would be uh, uh, very uh, nicely done. I think it fits uh, <clears throat> well with uh, the context of the site. I think it's actually going to set a newer context, context to the site, so I think that's that's really uh, interesting. I do like the way you've configured the, the buildings on the street fronts, and then, yeah, the parking obviously is tucked in behind there, and it's gonna be really tucked in there very nicely. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think you've, it's well thought out. I appreciate your, your bringing this to, uh, to us. Thank you. Now, Lee, where that your neighbors had, Curtis and there, what do you think you would say? I'm just joking. So. <laughs> so, so I'll make a motion for for approval of the of the concept as as presented, uh, with the uh, four-story uh, office and and multifamily building. Yes. Need a second. I'll second that. All right. The discussion. Further discussion now.
contingency with the TIF? Oh, this um, is just a concept yeah. rule. I think we need lots of, what, what do you need here? Yeah, so the they'll come back for um, the GIP and we will go through the public notification process for rezoning. We'll have them post the sign on the property. Um, at that time, we'll probably bring back the TIF request as well and we'll have it fleshed out. It's just a concept review, so, so that they can move forward. So the concept is, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Would it, uh, is, is it appropriate time to ask if we can put a four by eight foot sign on the site marketing the project? So yeah, when we first met with um, Mr. Newcomb, one of the things that he suggested is he would like to go ahead and put up a sign marketing the project. And I said, well, I wouldn't want our planning commission members to drive by and see <laughs> the concept without having seen the concept here. So I can get back to you and let you know what our ordinance says because I don't have it memorized, like this, you know, the size and everything like that. But I think four by eight for a property of that size seems reasonable there's a realtor sign listing the site for sale right now that's four by eight and we would just put it right over that sign. oh yeah okay yep okay. assuming that that one was approved and everything and i'm sure it meets our standards okay so thank you anybody had objection to that keep going okay. thank you so much well the motion is to for the cons uh, to prove the concept review for newcom mixed use development at 1312 john q hammond drive all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion passes unanimously. Go forward and put your uh, talk to Abby about the sign and do whatever needs to be done. Well, thank you guys. Thank you, thank you all. Great job. Wow, we are moving right along. We are on to item number seven. Yep, so apologies to um, the plan well, commission. This is the specific Oops. implementation plan for Middleton Center phase three. Milton Center Theory, LLC, yes. Um, the mayor pointed out before the meeting that what happened with this agenda item is that the staff comments from the last meeting were carried forward. And so our staff recommendation that's reflected in your printout is not accurate at this point. Um, we've done quite a bit of work with the applicant. And um, if you look at the memo that we included in, this, in the packet, our recommendation was for approval with some contingencies. Okay, so it's uh, changed. There's uh, approval with some contingencies. So okay. So do you want to say anything more, Abby? Or? Um, either that, or we can have the applicant. Come up and All right. Let's let the applicant come here and uh, let us see what they have. Just open up quick while our architects are getting our updated imagery. Um, John Hepner with T Wall. Um, so I think first, <laughs> what we'll like to do is just address some of the comments that we had received uh, from the last planning commission regarding the um, the imagery. Specifically, uh, received feedback on the long. Uh, looking facade of the building on the cor uh, corner of Parmenter and Terrace. So the, our architect, JLA, has made <clears throat> a couple of updates um, to address some of those comments. So do you want me to give you the mic? And then the, the other items that we'll, we're happy to talk about, as Abby had mentioned, we've been working diligently to um, kind of revise and restate the parking management plan, uh, again, kind of per our conversation last time. And while they're setting up, Abby, I have a question for the planning staff. Is there anything in um, city ordinance about being, being on the first floor of buildings in downtown um, in terms of using that space for shops versus parking? No. Um, there's nothing in any of our ordinances. I think in practice, and I'm sure that there are past planning documents that have made like design guideline recommendations that first floor level shops should have activated space, that for a pedestrian Hi. Um, I think that when the Middleton Center development project came forward, that was one of the two pluses for this 
over what was to be there because the old Middleton Center didn't really have storefront windows. Um, they didn't really interact with the sidewalk and the street as much as the redevelopment. So I think um, with regards to the concern about the a lot of the first floor being parking, even though they have put in the storefront windows, that's where our staff recommendation came in to try to activate the space. Okay. But it's nothing that's in an ordinance. Okay. Yeah. Right, okay. Good evening. Yes, go ahead. Okay. I'll just um, run through some of the things that we've done since our last meeting. Thank you. Um, so I won't um, belabor the point, but the main concern I think from this body last time was the length of the building yep. and yep. finding some ways to help break it up a little bit. Yep. Um, so we went back and looked at the details more than anything else, than, than huge, um, big massing movements because um, you know, we are lot line to lot line um, to, make, to make this project work. Um, <clears throat> so what we have done is varied the, the, um, the cornice, the parapets a little bit more um, as suggested. Um, we have varied the windows and the window detailing, specifically the trim around the windows um, more so they look uh, more independent as we um, walk down the street. We still have that same concept development pattern um, of phase uh, Middleton Center phase one and two, where a, a, a single building is massed and ma different materials are used um, to look like uh, various small, smaller buildings, excuse me. And then we've um, enhanced the renderings a little bit to make it um, more evident that these are engaged um, pedestrian level, ground level windows. They're clear glass. You can see into them. You can see the activity at the retail center. You can see the activity at the residential entries. And then you can see into the buildings at areas that um, do have um, parking in them. So you see in them, you see deep into the space. Um, there's depth there. There's not that um, covered windows or, or um, opaque glass like you guys have talked about last time. We don't like that either. Um, we like depth. In the, in the pedestrian um, perspective. Um, we are still open if, if you want to take it a step further to do some artwork type of um, things in those windows. Um, again, we don't have those that detailed, but that could be um, something we um, explore as a, as a condition as well. But um, clear glass looking into that ground floor um, space is, is important to us. Um, Otherwise, you know, the concept is the same, the use is the same, the density is the same, um, but we've just refined it based on uh, the comments from <coughs> last time. And I might just add one item too. So last time, the imagery that was seen actually had a different color scheme, slightly different. So this color scheme is actually a bit more vibrant, uh, and I think that also helped to delineate or give the perception of different buildings, different building sections built at in different periods of time, uh, which has been our goal overall. So the, the updated color scheme is what you see here too. Yes, we uh, like that where you are showing the break between the first and the second, and it seems a little bit lower at the top and also different color. Yeah, and, and one thing I forgot to mention was the introduction of some balconies on the street side oh, okay. um, to help with that give the elevations a little bit of depth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's some um, you can see on these and on the elevations that you received. Mm -hmm. um, going down the street, there's um, some more uh, French balconies in some instances. Some are, are deeper to allow for a, a small chair or two to be out there to activate that a little more. So the, the variety and the depth too adds a little bit of that visual interest. Joe, could you, could you run through, I mean, you can kind of see on, you know, here at Parmenter and Terrace, your right-hand image, that's yes, the Philly brick up above. And could you kind of run through the different building, exterior building materials as you move down? Sure, absolutely. Um, okay. So 
on the main on the end caps of both the buildings on both the ends so the orangish um, the light colored um, ends be between the buildings and then the the other end so orange the light colored here's two of the light color massings and the orange that's full masonry for for you know um, ground floor to roof um, so those are you know the end caps very prominent and we think very appropriate to have that um, material on to anchor those buildings and the development on the ground floor th throughout the the um, on all sides is is a masonry material um, it goes up a little bit higher on the street side than on the on the rear side but again to keep that pedestrian level um, experience rich uh, with high high quality not that the rest isn't high quality but um, the perceived high quality um, higher quality materials um, in this particular mass here, we do have some masonry that goes up a little bit higher, but uh, the majority of the other um, buildings or the small masses, um, it's a fiber cement siding. It's not an LP siding. Um, it's, a, it's a cementitious fiber cement, like the James Hardy um, type of, of siding of various colors um, and detailing. So um, we believe, we still believe that's a very high quality material um, and that is that is throughout all, all sides of the buildings does that make sense Jennifer what do you think I really like the improvements you made to break up the facades I think they look a lot more interesting I like the colors I think that sort of provides a vibrancy that wasn't in your prior design I think that's those are great things I I do want to talk a little more about the parking because I'm I am concerned about sort of this use on the first floor. I may have kind of hinted at that in my question to Abby, thinking that here's a great use for business and you know having the parking on that level is a little bit of a concern. I think at some point the city would say, "Wow, you know maybe we should have put shops in there." So. That's just one of the things that, as we talk about the parking that, that I'm thinking about. Um, but I think the design looks great. I think it looks um, like you've put a lot more thought into it, and I appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you. And, and it really was just refinements based on the feedback we got, so we didn't do anything really outrageously changing it. Um, the parking issue, you know, we need parking. You know, there's, there's that whole bigger picture issue um, and I think the way we handled it is uh, sympathetic to the streetscape and, and the overall building design um, so if we're gonna have ground floor parking um, you know it's not the entire ground floor it's it's in the middle of the of the um, buildings and it's treated with the same uh, architectural patterns and fenestration of the rest of the building to blend in so and it's not just mask or cover up with opaque glass that you walk through it's really flat it has some depth and dimension I'm a big proponent of of it I I, I think it's cool to have that clear glass looking in and seeing actually the, I do like the clear glass that choice if it if it was to be on the ground floor I'm just the concept of it being on the ground floor is I guess I'm concerned the city of Middleton might want to use that space for shops or businesses or actual um, uses that are not parking. So, and that's m maybe a you know it's a to be even yeah. the the yeah. design in a sense. So you think there's a question of demand too? So I, I mean, if, uh, if and there was a demand, they probably would want to do it. Another is. Uh, it's right next to the housing on the other side of the terrace, so it's sort of a good transition, I one would think. I, I don't know, what do you? I wonder but that's a there, good point. Is there a way to like future-proof it somehow, where it could, I know you still have to get down into the underground, but could there be a way to make it such that the space could easily be converted? Uh, easily is the key there. No, um, you're right because we do we do access 
we do have access to the underground parking through that. So um, probably not. And, and, and I do agree with the mayor. It is a, a nice transition, um, you know, the, the downtown, the, the commercial retail part of Middleton Center is, you know, over here and it transitions, you know, one more retail shop and then it gets to be more of a residential feel here. So I think it's appropriate, but it's, you know, it's always a subjective discussion. Joe, what, what, what is the current parking ratio? You probably need those parking stalls yes. to support the units above currently, right? Correct. Yeah. How, how many parking stalls and how many units? I just so there are 84 parking stalls in phase three and 65 units. Yep. So a little over a one-to-one, -one, but then you have the 3,100 square feet of retail already. So, right. you know, really that right. seems like a very uh, realistic amount of parking for the residential and that 3,100 square feet of retail. and. I think, you know, the other piece is, you know, we do feel strongly that a retail component on the corner there will look very nice, especially with, it's very engaging on that corner. The concern is that additional retail as you get deeper into Terrace Avenue, which is not as heavily traveled, uh, especially considering the amount of retail in Middleton Center 1 and 2, it starts to kind of get away from the retail zone uh, per se. And so I think that, you know, we're confident in the amount of retail that we have uh, in the location that it is currently in. And um, j just, a, you know, I, I would agree with the mayor as well and with what Joe had stated about a transition between retail and then residential. Um, and so that's really why, and, and the parking, but those are really the reasons why we decided not to pursue additional retail in that location, but still wanted to accomplish pedestrian connectivity to the street and Abby did uh, propose a couple of different um, laser cut metal um, art pieces that could go in the windows there and we've already kind of discussed how we would do that in between <clears throat> probably in between the glass on the inside and, and in between the parking bollard so it wouldn't be disrupted by a car potentially so we've already kind of been looking at how we would do that. Other questions, Jennifer? I know we had talked about the parking last time um, and how, how much use is in phase one and two. Um, Abby, has there ever been any exceptions made? Um, and I know in this case, there were some in the, in the first two phases, but relative to other developments downtown or um, you know, a sort of a reduction based on some of the components of the design. Has the city ever done that? We have done that through the FAP process previously, especially for affordable housing developments because they typically tend to have a lower uh, vehicle ownership profile for their tenants. Um, I think that with this development, maybe we've gone the furthest as far as looking at whole shared parking analysis for the whole for all three phases of the development um, although admittedly our parking standards are a little outdated so Madison's for apartments they look at one per one unit regardless of the size of the unit um, so I think through the SIP pro process we have been um, reducing the parking that's required in the development and we have done that with so Jennifer, I actually, you know, went there, uh, first I went with Abby and looked at that, how those parking was used. And then I went three times thereafter. Once I just uh, went, uh, I think was again about noon. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of days ago, I went there about nine. And last night I went there a little after 10. So I just wanted to see that, uh, you know, are there some tenants there and where are they parking there? So, so I saw that there were 11 people parked in right along the Terrace Avenue and there were various numbers and there were 38 on the ground floor and, but they still had three empty spaces downstairs and one in the handicap parking. And on top of that, in those 51 lift and slide places, they had only eight used. They had 43 empty there too. 
So, and then I went to phase two. They had only three or four cars, and you have a whole space lying empty. Of course, they're not occupied there. So, so after seeing that and uh, doing it uh, two, two, three times, uh, I'm a little bit less concerned. I think there's plenty of parking there. As far as I can see as of today, consider, you said that your uh, phase one is 90% occupied, right? Yeah, if not more now. We just had uh, the whole third floor move in. Um, oh, what is the user's name? See, I don't get into the commercial <laughs> okay. piece that often, but uh, I mean, the the parking though is still um, satisfactory as we had anticipated with that whole third floor now being full as well. So um, yeah, I, I think we're at least 90%, if not 95% now. Mm, okay. And just going back to the last meeting, we had like an hour plus discussion about the parking at Middleton Center. And my concern was, was more about not signing the parking for an, an individual tenant. And I think our whole parking in the downtown would function better if nobody had signs on anything and it was first come, first serve. But <laughs> when it's private parking, we don't really get to tell people to do that. But I mean, when you sign a stall for residential customer and then that person's not home, why not allow that to be used instead for someone else? And I think everything would function very well and we need to make it easier for people to park inside the building and underground at Middleton Center. And I think that what John has come up with for revisions to the parking management plan would satisfy the concerns that I had at the last meeting about parking. And I think it's a good solution going back more toward a shared parking model for the development. And the one question I did just want to mention, and I talked with John about this in a meeting earlier today, is this is this uh, what is before you tonight is just phase three of the development and so one idea I floated by John would be to bring back phases one and two as a minor SIP modification to just update those uh, update the parking management plan the new version um, and make sure that that is part of the zoning for all three phases because I think this the solution that worked out is a pretty good one and I think it'll function even better <coughs> than it's functioning now. Um, our recommendation for this is uh, for approval tonight with some contingencies, but I would like the opportunity to bring back phases one and phase two so that we can incorporate the updated parking management plan into those two phases. So in this table, these. 30 parking spaces along the Terrace Avenue, they will go away once they fix it, so, once they build it, so, mm -hmm. and, and you understand it, so. Mm -hmm. So I don't really mm, have any parking issues right now after looking at that carefully, but I would like at some stage, of course, you know, as Abby said, it's a private uh, outfit, that if there was a, any public parking at some stage, like when you got an event at the plaza or some of those things. And a lot of those people are going to go to your establishment as well. So, so that is something which we need to look at. And uh, when you look at your phase two, I know it's, uh, it's you think it's 30% occupied or something? Or? Uh, phase two is actually, <clears throat> for the multifamily anyway, it's probably up in the 60, 65% range already. Wow. Yeah, wow. we've been having a lot of success <laughs> in a short period of time. So, I mean, it just continues to support uh, why multifamily is still super important downtown. And, um, you know, we see a lot of construction going on, but there's a lot of need and a lot of want for it. So we're really pleased with it. It gives us a lot of confidence, too, that phase three should get under construction now. <laughs> So yeah, so I looked in phase two. There were only four cars at uh, at that uh, surface level at ten o'clock. So and I had checked the day before it, during the day. It was again, you know, not not much occupied. So and it's that's helpful to know because that means the tenants are using the underground mm -hmm. parking as they should be. So thank you for doing your research. Yeah. <laughs> so my concern would be that. Uh, if any of the tenants start parking along the roadside and taking that away from the other people. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how would we monitor and control that part? I think that would be an issue which I would be and the city would be concerned with. Yeah, and I think that comes down to the city monitoring the two hour 
regulation. Now, at one stage, you were going to have a stickers on your tenants. Is that still happening? Yeah, and we and we do. And Terrence has stated before too that if mm-hmm. um, members of the community or staff see mm-hmm. uh, our parking permits, which they need to have to be parked down in the garage in okay. in, in the underground garage, if you see those on vehicles, feel free to take down the license plate and contact our property management team, and they'll they'll be happy to gently remind the okay. tenant that they need to be parking underground as a part of our agreement with the city. Okay. Yeah, I'm quite happy with what I saw in terms of parking. So, and I think I also like the way you guys have broken up that thing and uh, made those changes, so. Leaf. I too uh, would agree with Jennifer is that I do like what you've done as far as the aesthetics of the facades. I think that's, that's been very nicely done but I too, too, as well, echo Jennifer's concern about parking on the first floor. It doesn't. It doesn't sound like we have, and I understand the the uh, challenge with getting retail on the first floor, especially as you get further down terrace. I mean, I understand the whole challenge of retail. Period. In this day and age, we're having. I know that we've changed the square footage of uh, retail in in phase one and in two, well, phase one for sure. You know, it, it get changed from so much retail to more uh, residential or multifamily, that type of thing. Because I think of the market challenge that that you that you guys uh, came up against. Um, but nevertheless, I do wonder if someday there won't be an opportunity for. Uh, retail on the first floor as we move down terrace and I also agree with Jennifer that you know if there is a way to kind of design it so we could uh, someday maybe change that I know I'm looking at pie in the sky right now and I I know I'm not thinking about economics or costs at all but I do think um, that parking on the first floor just somehow I understand the clear glass concept, but you know it's great. You know I'm going to walk down and go. Oh, is this a uh, used car lot here? Uh, are we selling cars, or what are we doing downtown with all the cars in there? As I look at them in the in the, in the storefront, so to speak. Uh, that's what I. You know it sounds like we have enough parking mm-hmm. in this, and I and I agree with Abby. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. we should bring it back and look at it on a um, comprehensive. Mm-hmm. perspective to see exactly what is the parking need for this development phase one phase two phase three I uh, heard up you did your research mm-hmm. and found that maybe all the stalls weren't being utilized yep. already in phase yep. Yep. Uh, in the in the two phases and maybe we don't need that first story uh, parking in phase three because we already have enough parking or or whatever I think we do need to look at that Abby um, I think that's and Pretty. and I but I but I know if we take the parking out of that first floor, then the retail is gonna you know retail is just not gonna happen there either. I understand that because of the of the of the way the market is. So I don't know unless we put more multifamily first floor or something like that. Um, which I just want to make sure that we're not Where building a space, parking yeah. lot on the first floor of this phase three. Mm-hmm. That is not really needed. I think that it, it, the discussion I heard tonight mm-hmm. kind of making me question that: Do we really need all that parking on the first floor there? And maybe we could use the space for something else. Maybe it isn't retail, but maybe it's residential. I, you know, that's uh, just my thought. I, I think part of what has been brought up in the past too is since phase three is kind of standing alone per se across the railroad tracks. Right you know, the amount of parking, you know, they're going to have to be reliant, both buildings on each other's parking already. And in phase one and two, uh, you know, residents can park at, you know, at late at night in either one of the developments if they'd like. And so there's plenty of parking to be shared over on that side of the railroad tracks. But I think if we came to the point where, you know, for whatever reason we needed to require 
a tenant to have to walk across the railroad tracks or around the railroad tracks if they were a resident in phase three then that would become problematic from a rental perspective and so you know in in saying you know we definitely have an ample amount of parking i think phase three is kind of standalone as well and it does have uh, a good mix of multifamily and retail with the amount of parking um, to make sure that it can stand alone across the railroad tracks and have its have its parking needs met so yeah, I, I i see it both ways that, that's kind of where i'm coming from as well it's just kind of like sort of question of demand and supply so michael you have been with developments for a long time with howdy and howdy so what do you how do you see this ratio of uh, you know, units to parking, and you think that uh, is there too much parking already there, and could be reduced? Or I mean, al although I, I understand the concerns, I also I also know that from a security standpoint, mm -hmm. residents in multifamily buildings, to John's point, you know, they want to be able to pull into a garage, yep. secure Park environment, door comes down, yep. mm -hmm. and they go to the elevator and they go up to their unit. That's really really important, um, mm -hmm. especially if they're coming back late in the evening. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important that you make sure that you have, for the number of units that you have there, that you have ample parking within the building, not even though there might be extra parking mm -hmm. across the railroad tracks, I think it's important that you have you know, ample parking for your residential users on that footprint um, to the extent that you can achieve it. Um, I, you know, I agree it'd be nice if, if there were more retail, but the, the reality is what is the real demand for that? You know, as you move down Terrace Avenue, I think as soon as you get away from the corner, I think it's going to be, my sense is that it would probably be problematic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that'll be the case 10 years from now, 20 years from now, but, mm -hmm. but I would today think, it will be. Yeah, today, I yeah. think that would be a yeah. problem. You know, one, one question that I had, you know, one of the great things about downtown Middleton is all the terrace activity we have when we do have decent weather. And so the question with a zero lot line building, Joe, you know, I, I know you're kind of like this, this corner building that will be retail, you know, is there any opportunity for any outside terrace activity that could be incorporated? I don't know if there's enough sidewalk with there that you can have some outdoor seating if that happened to be a restaurant or, you know, some type of use. I think it would be nice to continue that, that feel that I think we all enjoy and love about downtown Middleton to mm -hmm. this site as well. I don't, I don't know if that's doable. I mean, I know you want to have a strong corner state right there. It, um, it would definitely be in the right of way so that would be something the city would have to chime in on there there's very little width along Terrace Avenue so it would be a real tight not that that would be bad you know some some of those kind of environments are kind of nice you know real tight you have to squeeze by as you walk down the sidewalk the table hmm. um, you know it's vibrant there's a little more space on uh, on the inside so um, that's a possibility, but again, it would have to be in the right of way because of just the the site, the size and dimensional constraints of the site. It just happens to be the minimum for a development like this. I, I think <clears throat> one item I would add too is that, and I, and again, I can't make any promises here, but we're in conversation with B Cycle, and. Mm -hmm. They, again, are a business just like the community car conversation where they pick and choose their locations, but they have shown interest in somewhere on the Middleton Center development site, um, and now they have their upgraded electric bikes, which are pretty sweet. So, and that is something where they work with the municipality to put it in the terrace. Um, so that definitely has some potential, and we're happy to continue that conversation to see if something like that could go on the corner here or even out in front of the, uh, well, in the terrace, but in front of the portion, the section of the building where the cars are parked. So, I mean, that's a, a, a conversation we'll continue to have, and mm -hmm. we can um, definitely offer up this corner, but I think, frankly, if B-Cycle wants to be on our site anywhere, we'd all love for them to be somewhere on the site, but we can mm -hmm. certainly at least discuss the, this location as well. Good idea, Michael. Had you guys thought at all of putting the parking in one building, a separate structure, but make it look like the architecture of the rest of the development? That would, I mean, that would require a significant decrease in the 
density. Um, and at that point, I think our parking requirements would go down so significantly that building a standalone parking structure just would not make financial sense. Does that make sense? So the density of the whole development wouldn't it, it, there wouldn't be as many units is that well right because i mean because of the size of the site if if we decreased if we decided that a portion of the site was going to become a standalone parking structure the density of the buildings the density of the overall third phase would decrease so much that at that point we would be better off just doing one building with underground parking and but then we would leave we'd be leaving a whole section of our site undeveloped is that what you're saying? Or you're saying keep all of the parking in one, but still have the two buildings? Like, let's say building G becomes parking and building F is the residential and yeah, so that's what you business would is. I'm just curious. I mean, it would, it would be less expensive to probably build the parking um, overall just because you've got two separate underground components ramps, you're taking up a lot of space. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've thought about that at no. all. And it kind of goes back to Mike's point too about having the secured parking for residents within the building versus... Right, so if you did, you know, a section of this building, then as a, you know, <coughs> I'm just, I'm just tossing other ideas out there because I just, I don't know. I think the the value of having ground floor space will be lost on the city eventually. Some will have wished we, we could have better utilized that space for something that could potentially generate more activity, more tax dollars, whatever it might be. And so I'm a little bit concerned about that. And so that's why I'm wondering if the other part of that is a standalone structure might give opportunities for um, the city and events like, you know, things that might happen on Terrace Avenue. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't want to go back, uh, you know, to the beginning of our first uh, proposal for redevelopment of Middleton Center, but this is a discussion that was had um, in some depth about an opportunity for a standalone parking structure and for the city to to also um, you know have some public a public parking component within it and I wasn't a part of all of those discussions but I know that in the end the decision was that we weren't going to go that route no that's actually true yeah but Michael said is you know the safety is pretty important if you come at night or 10 at night and you don't want to walk from a park to structure to your uh, yeah, this would be you want safe. to drive there and go up and uh, even if you were there so I think uh, safety is pretty important isn't it so yeah I wouldn't want to propose something that wouldn't be safe maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, yeah. I'm just I'm throwing some other ideas out there so we'll yeah, that's a good great idea yes does the what was the discussion and what decision was made Oh, about the, about the ramp, it I does guess. affect some of the other campus committee planning things that we're dealing with and so that's why I'm kind of asking because ultimately somewhere the city is going to need to worry about parking and this is actually a location where it might make some sense with different activities occurring in the commercial zone that's already been created here with the development down with Capitol Brewery some of the th events that occur there both those types of things. So I'm curious what the discussion was. My recollection of the discussion, the mayor can maybe add to this, was at one point we asked Tewal to calculate the cost to add an additional level of parking in phase two. And we looked at the option of possibly having the city um, pay for the cost of that additional level, which would be public parking, and it was cost prohibitive because we were, I think we were bumping up against a new construction classification or something when we added the other layer, and so building code standards were more strict, and it, I, I remember the cost being 
way more than we anticipated. So we were kind of thinking like structured parking would maybe at most be like thirty thousand dollars a stall, and this was more than what we had guessed. Do you remember any other? Yeah. Conversations so about we looked at the building a standalone parking ramp, and uh, we spent quite a bit of time on that one too, and uh, went through even having the parking ramp, apartments on the top, and. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and then we had the Walker study, and the Walker folks thought that you really don't have a shortage of parking. Oh, right. But, uh, so, but we have gone through this parking ramp more than once. And that was for the property between yep. the city between hall the and the senior center, center and the city okay. hall. And it, it's very possible that we end up uh, building a parking ramp there in any case, but uh, at that time, y you know, the Walker folks said you don't really have a shortage so so a lot of people disagree but uh, you know like even George would say it's not a question of parking it is people want to park right in front of where they want to go and that is uh, that's an issue rather than the availability of parking so yeah you bring a lot of good points it's also a question of demand and supply if uh, if you right now if you can't have a you know, you could have apartments there on the ground floor, but if there's nobody who wants to take that space, retail is uh, is a problem now, as you know. So Amazon is eating everybody's lunch. So so we would be happy that if we can keep what we have. So. Yeah, but certainly that is an apartment on the ground floor would probably be more friendly to the neighbors across the street. I mean, yeah. it would be a different kind of a feel right there in terms of the livability and walking up to somebody's apartment there on the first floor. So how do you feel about there are parking lots there now, two of them. So there's a one mm, where there are 30 or what a number of parking lots and then there's the other one. I mean, they we have the parking lots right there now too. So. I mean, I guess my, my thought about it is it would be nice to kind of keep that block that's closest to Parmenter as space where it could be utilized for years and years and years, um, even on the ground floor for, you know, people to live there or to work there or to have a business there not use it for parking. The other portions of the closer down uh, terrace, um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm thinking will be sort of, it would be logical to put parking somewhere near the path that's been created, so it'll be easier for the public to kind of find a spot if they're looking, or um, other uses that might be occurring downtown relative to the development of the town center, or things like that. So that's kind of where I'm thinking, but it would be nice to keep one of these buildings with ground level development that um, the city could actually have some, see some benefit for either people living there or a business going in. And I, plus, I've just never seen this kind of example of parking on the ground floor of a building in the middle of a downtown, which, unless it's a car salesman or something. <laughs> so it's just a little bit not. C it City doesn't of Madison seem like doesn't allow it. To me. it. They don't allow it. So um, just to give a little more perspective on, so on this building on Terrace and Parmenter, um, if you look at the overall length, only about half of the length of the street side has parking. The rest is activated by the retail, the, the common space or, or entries. Um, and it's even less for the other building. It's probably a quarter or a third at the most. Daphne, could you go to 117, yeah. I think? Is this? So the top image is the floor plan of the first floor of building F, correct? 
Um, yes, it's a little foreshortened, but yes. The scale. It, well, it, yeah, this has been scaled down significantly to fit into a Word doc. Right. But that's, I'm just taking a visual estimate. It looks to be about half of the, half of the uh, street frontage for that building. Okay, so is the one below it to the left, or this? The, the, it's about half. You've cut, you've made a cut line down the middle of the image, or not sure I understand. So the street. This is the street. So the street. Okay. Um, length. Again, it's just a visual, but that's, that's probably about half. Okay. Maybe, maybe a little more. So do we have this in our packet? That, that's what is up. It's just kind of foreshortened there for some reason. I, I don't know why that's squeezed down. The scale of that is. Oh, okay. That plan should be within the it's packet. Not to this scale. is a part of the no. That's this is a part of the parking management plan. And then the color, the color is the, the the colored portions of this is really what was to be focused on for the parking management plan itself. Okay. And then this is the other building where we have the lobby and entries right. and exits, and then we do have some units, units Which here. Like. Right. So it's this portion, yeah. which maybe it's a third mm -hmm. at the most. Could you, on that parking management plan image that was up, the black and the turquoise that was on the Terrace Avenue side, mm -hmm. could you convert that to functional space but keep the parking that's on the railroad side? I mean, would there be any sort of a tenant that would be able to occupy a space that is that shallow, like a small office? I'm thinking of like the Edward Jones, the city leases space to Edward Jones in the senior center, and that's not a very deep office building, and it's really just a couple of people in there, but would would that work for the, the sidewalk side um, to create some small, office spaces there, reduce your parking, but keep the at-grade parking that's in the back and still ramp down? Um, I mean, my gut reaction is that you'd have to provide more, more depth for a commercial tenant there, which would then eat into your drive aisle. So then you're going to be left with the railroad side of the back of the building completely unutilized uh, for you know, for, well. There would only be 18, less than 18 feet. Yeah. Depth. I mean, I would, I would totally agree um, with your comments about the ground floor parking if the entire ground floor were parking. But I think we successfully break it up, um, put it in probably the best spot it could be, which is the center of the building, right? And break it up with end caps that are, um, actually have occupiable space. Um, and then integrate it into the architecture of the building as well. So um, the parking is needed, right? I, I think it's we also need to accommodate a, ramping down on the site. Yeah. Um, it also, if you increase the number of apartments or office, that means you will be decreasing the number of parking spaces. So correct, and reducing our ratios. Yeah. I think it is a challenging site, and given the amount of parking that we've in, in part been requested to pro provide, but also know that we would like to have for this standalone building. I think Joe and JLA has, has created a unique way to provide the parking, and it's, it's definitely different. It's a little more, I don't know, futuristic, contemporary. I'm not sure exactly how to explain it, but it's, it it's maybe I'll call it unique and just leave it at that. But I think it's it, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's, it is urban, um, but it's a challenging site. And so to incorporate it in the way that they have and for Abby to also recommend, you know, an additional way to try and, um, you know, make that space, make that a little more visually captivating. Um, you know, that's what we've tried to do with the, the site envelope that we have. John, John, a question for you. So if you, if you, if you guys took the entire site, the entire length of the site and had one 
underground parking layout because I mean if you look at this layout I mean there's a lot of efficiencies with the ramps and that I mean it just just the nature of two separate buildings you know really narrow footprint so if you just went with one full level of underground parking the entire length of both sites did you look at that so we yeah, yeah. We, we that's can't what we would prefer to do yeah, yeah that's what you prefer to do right well yeah we'd it's love to efficient. do that there's an enormous um well easement but there are a number of utilities large utilities that actually run through that thoroughfare that begins uh, between middleton center one and two then goes across the tracks where the water tower is so yes uh, and terrence <laughs> was aggravated and wanted to attempt to go underneath that even so we explored that that's just really not an option per engineering it's dangerous and for you know potential future um maintenance on the on those utilities would make it nearly impossible and um so yes we explored that and unfortunately it's a main thoroughfare for well it, it'll be a thoroughfare for pedestrians as well but it's uh it's has a lot of utilities underneath it that are really um, large pipes yes yeah, I think it's yeah. unfortunate but if that had been the case yeah that, well we would have definitely that's what that. yeah that's definitely what you would have seen you could have had secured parking the entire length <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. Oh, yeah to your point and then you could have probably had residential units yeah. at street level because you're getting you're putting all the parking down below and mm -hmm. maybe you push some of the parking to the, the far west end of the site yeah and you'd still be able to we would have definitely but done that with those utilities that run through there I, that's yeah i understand that so that would have changed the whole thing unless the mayor wants to you know fund the movement of you know of, of those utilities right <laughs> <laughs> just kidding yeah so you well i guess you guys looked into we couldn't really do much with the utilities you couldn't move I, them I didn't, I didn't look into the cost i'm sure you guys Review that at some point. In yeah, I mean, it, my my recollection is that engineering said that to um, well, and and they're running underneath the railroad track as well. So to relocate those would be an enormous expense, and mm -hmm. it would also take a lot of time and effort, and potentially um, would be rejected by the railroad. I mean, truthfully, m you know, money is money, but the railroad can be very difficult to work with and to <laughs> potentially put them out of service when that train runs, you know, two to three times a day. I'm not sure exactly how that conversation would be met, but, um, but and then even just in speaking with engineering staff there, they were saying that, that the relocation would be very, very difficult because of the size. Would it be... As much money as two ramps? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Like TIF money yeah. for I mean, the, the pipes are what? Four? Yeah, I'm not sure what something. all runs through there, but I would estimate it into the million dollar range. At least. That's part of what the trade offs are, right? Well, it'd be nice to know if that was indeed the case that we've hit a roadblock with that information, most definitely. But um, I don't know how, you know, if that's just a conversation with engineering and that's good enough, or there's some actual, you know, way that we can document that we can't do that. I'm just saying, it's it just the ground floor parking, the way that it's designed, I don't like. <laughs> so. I guess I'm sh it was to your own advantage. I'm sure they looked at it. You want to have another look, or you think uh, you're done? I, I can I can assure you that uh, my that Terrence was very adamant about wanting to make this one building. I mean, it would have been one building, uh, or 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 well, it would have been park. broken all broken up differently. But um, we would have built over that section, and there would have been one one linear ramp, as Mike had mentioned, it would have been much more cost effective for us. I mean, right now with the two underground ramps, I mean, you're building out two additional foundation walls and that's expensive right there. So there's, there's, there would have been a big, a large financial cost associated with, well, 
if, if, the, if the easement didn't exist, we would have saved a lot of money by just having one ramp. So we, we've investigated it quite a bit. Okay, other questions? Well, I know it, this is not perfect. The motion is to approve the specific implementation plan for the Milton Center Phase 3. Milton Center 3 LLC. The motion is to approve. So. That was, who made a motion? That's the staff the staff recommendation is. Oh, okay. So we need a motion to approve. So I'll make a motion for approval. Okay, need a second. Wow. Yeah, I'm now I can second it, right? Yeah, okay, I second it. <laughs> so let just for clarification, mm -hmm. so the motion was to approve the specific implementation plan. Mm -hmm. Is that with the contingencies that we recommended? Yes, I'll clarify yeah. that okay. with the contingencies that staff recommended. Yep, yep. And those were resolution of engineering and planning staff recommendations, adoption of the amended and restated parking management plan. We would bring back phases one and two to include that as part of the SIP document and then addition of an art element inside the windows of the first floor parking structure, mm -hmm. um, which maybe would require design review at a later date, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, any other questions or comments now, so. Okay, so the motion is to prove all those in favor say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay, so two two. So it goes to the city council, right? Or not? Yeah, I think it would go to the city council with the split okay. vote. Okay. All right, that's where we are, folks. So I would pr I probably will seek clarification though from our city attorney on this because this motion didn't pass. Um, so I need to I will need to talk with him and make sure that that is enough to for us to put it on the council agenda or whether it would need to come back to the planning commission. Okay. So meanwhile, it gives you some time to think about various parts of the discussion. So you can, well, anyways, I, I don't think it's so much further along that you can change a whole lot there, right? We'll, we'll discuss the feedback that we received, but. Yeah, main thing is if there's a, any way to connect those without spending too much money, that probably will change. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the feedback. Thank okay. you. Okay, okay, all right, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, move on to the last item, item number eight, planning department operating budget. Requesting any changes to revenues <laughs> or operating expenses. Motion for approval. Second. Second. <laughs> any questions or discussion? All those in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So needs a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. So we are adjourned. <laughs>